Doncic three quarters to inch, followed by Prince Lancelot five off the pace, and Jetivator still at the back of the field. Five lengths covers them approaching the quarter pole, and it's Devil Moon who's been the controlling speed. Exultation and Doncic second and third throughout. Then Jetivator swinging into action on the far outside. They're at the top of the stretch. Doncic trying to get out. Exultation trying to keep him in. Exultation right to Devil Moon and takes the lead, hand ridden to the front. Doncic is in third, angling out for a final try at Exultation, and it's a big try. Here comes Doncic on the outside. And who was best? Doncic under Frankie Dettori, overcoming some obstacles to run down exaltation. Negate. And they're off. Zizek's Violet Storm. Here's Miss Kaline hustled hard up to Vi for the lead. Story of Chrome is one from the rail in midnight silence. Four deep into the first turn as four of them line up. Zizek's along the inside, just ahead in front. Miss Kaline moves clearly into second. They're followed by Glory of Chrome between rivals. Midnight Silence on the outside takes third. The gray is Violet Storm, two and a half front to back, less than six furlongs to run. And it's Zizek's by a head to Miss Kaline. They come to the back stretch together. Midnight Silence tugging her way forward in third. Then Violet Storm at the rail, matching strides. And between those two, Glory of Chrome. Continuing on with a very compact group, five furlongs out, Zizek's a neck. Miss Kaline second, a length and a half to Violet Storm. Midnight Silence covers the most ground. Glory of Chrome will be in between those two. Gets a little nudge now as they head toward the three-eighth pole. And it's Zizek's and Miss Kaline. Zizek's traveling comfortably enough, leads it by a head to Miss Kaline in second. Midnight Silence outside of them. Violet Storm looking for room, appears to have some run, does Violet Storm trying to get through that narrow opening inside of Zizix, and it's there now. Zizix, Violet Storm comes through on the inside, and Violet Storm takes the lead three sixteenths from home. Midnight Silence on the outside, battling with Zizix as they come to the eighth pole. It's Armando Aguilar and Violet Storm putting this field away. Violet Storm by four past the 16th pole and will win for fun. Violet Storm strolls in by almost six lengths. Zizix outgamed Midnight Silence, then Glory of Chrome. Zabul to the outside. They're in the gate. And they're off. Papa Tiger gets the first call in the middle of the course. Street Humor is coming through, and West Coast Gangster is now racing in third. They're followed by Incredible Mo. Zabul racing on the outside of Take Action. Down the back stretch. And the lead belongs to Papa Tiger, who has it by two and a half lengths over West Coast Gangster in second. They're followed by Street Humor and Incredible Mo. There goes Zabul. Zabul all the way up now to take the second spot. And a gap of four to the trailer. Take action. Less than a half mile to go. Papa Tiger the leader. Zabul into second. Followed by Incredible Mo. now third. At the rail, it's Street Humor in the black colors, having to steady just slightly. And three wide is West Coast Gangster. Another two back to take action. It's been an easy lead for Papa Tiger, maintaining it by a length and a half. Zabul under heavy pressure in second. Street Humor very much in the thick of it. As the field turns for home, take action, surfacing from the back. Top of the lane, and it's Papa Tiger, two-length lead. Take action, looking for room in the yellow colors. Zabul still fighting on. Street Humor is in between Street Humor and Zabul. Getting to Papa Tiger late. Zabul on the outside. Now forges to the front, and it will be Zabul. A hard-fought victory at a a very short number. Street Humor second, take action and pop a tiger.
In the gate. And they're off. Paco's Pico and New Every Morning. Those two speed away in the opening furlong. Divine Feminine Tembo now moves up, takes third. Muhammad Ali is down at the rail. New Every Morning just in front of Paco's Pico. And Tembo will get a nice cozy position just off the top pair with four lengths to make up. He's followed by Muhammad Ali down at the rail. And then it's Divine Feminine. Six furlongs to run. And it's New Every Morning by a head. Paco's Pico continues right up alongside. Four and a half back to Tembo in third. Then two more, Divine Feminine, Muhammad Ali. Five eighths to run. And they're still head and head, but now it's Paco's Pico asserting himself and opening up a length and a half quickly on new morning in second. Another two back to Tembo third, followed by Divine Feminine and Muhammad Ali has lost touch. 15 lengths off the leader, heading toward the three-eighth pole. Puck goes, Pico the one to catch. Now Tembo comes after him smartly in second. Paco's Pico and Tembo past the three-eighth pole together, heads apart as Divine Feminine takes third. New every morning has dropped out of it. Muhammad Ali has been no factor. Tembo's yellow blinkers on the outside of Paco's Pico as the field turns for home. It's Tembo just in front. Paco's Pico, Divine Feminine, four back in third. Three sixteenths of a mile to go. Tembo and Paco's Pico continue to slug it out. And Divine Feminine's trying to pick up the pieces, grinding away three back third. Tembo, Paco's Pico, Divine Feminine getting closer. Tembo, Divine Feminine. Tembo or Divine Feminine, Tembo prevails. Divine Feminine second, Paco's Pico third. We're in the gate. And they're off. A slight stumble there for Woodbine Way, but a quick recovery and right to the front. Tepet Dull on the inside is up close. Quarry of Thunder on the pace while under a tight hold. And Awesome Taylor is four deep. Back on the street just behind this group. Chasing Serendipity is second to last. And Built Different is seven lengths. Off front running Woodbine Way who takes him to the back stretch by about two lengths. Quarry of Thunder is racing in second, followed by Tappet Dew on the inside of Awesome Taylor, and then back on the street behind that pair, four off the lead. Two more chasing Serendipity and a length and a half to Built Different. They swing onto the back stretch with Woodbine Way to catch, has it by two lengths as they run toward the half mile pole. Quarry of Thunder is in second, followed by Tappet Dew along the rail, third, Awesome Taylor, widest of all. Chasing Serendipity has gotten a little bit closer, nowhere to go at this stage. Back on the street in between those two, and Built Different continues at the back. It's Woodbine Way, Quarry of Thunder. They've been 1-2 most of the way with Tappet Dew in second. Chasing Serendipity angled off the rail, gets a little bit of breathing room in fourth. Built Different is up to fifth with a quarter of a mile to go, and Woodbine Way still to catch at the top of the stretch. Two-length lead on Quarry of Thunder, chasing Serendipity and Built Different in the center of the race course. They're in the final furlongs. Tappet Dew is stymied as Chasing Serendipity kicks it in and mows them down. It's Chasing Serendipity with a nice rally and another win for Vladimir Sorin. Juan Hernandez in chasing serendipity by two. Quarry of Thunder second. Woodbine Way held on to third in front of Tepidu and built different. Discrepancy will be the last one. They're in the gate. And they're off. Ultimate authority, and she's a Tempest. She's a Tempest a little bit quicker. Discrepancy comes away in third, and gate to paradise 
is moving through along the inside, pretty eager in the opening stages and finding a seam on the inside of She's a Tempest. That door closed pretty quickly as She's a Tempest clears off to lead it by a length and a half. Ultimate Authority second and Gate to Paradise is down at the rail, just about a length and a half off the lead. Discrepancy has two and a half to make up. Onto the back stretch, and it's She's a Tempest and Tiago Pereira leading the way by a half length. Ultimate Authority. Now moving up alongside in second and gate to paradise, keeping pace a length and a half off the leader in third. Discrepancy is just outside of her. They're coming to the half mile pole and it's she's a tempest. Trying to stretch that speed out, leads the way still by a neck. Ultimate authority, the gray is gate to paradise and discrepancy. Round the turn, three furlongs out. She's a tempest still by a head. Ultimate Authority in second. Now Gate to Paradise is being hard ridden along the inside, trying to keep pace and discrepancy on the outside. They pass the quarter pole and turn for home. She's a Tempest and Ultimate Authority. Ultimate Authority on the outside takes a narrow lead. She's a Tempest fighting bravely. Four back to Gate to Paradise in third. One furlong left. She's a Tempest comes back, has her head in front of Ultimate Authority. They'll come for the wire together. She's a Tempest or Ultimate Authority knows to nose she's a tempest just in front photo finish look like she's a tempest but we'll wait for the placing judges very close between her and ultimate authority then it was gate to paradise in third photo finish in the sixth and that would be three for steve knapp if she held on there's We'll say Emma to the outside. And they're off. Song of Shadows breaks out beautifully and goes straight to the front. Palio's Princess has speed. They're joined by Cocktail Princess inside of them now to grab second. Dulce Emma, four, two and a half off the leaders, followed by Satoshi, who's down at the rail. Then it's I'll Have Another Kiss in just a little tight between rivals. The two trailers, Don't You Forget, and Square Tomatoes. It's a compact group that heads past the half-mile pole. Cocktail Princess, narrow lead. Then it's Song of Shadows in between horses and Palio's Princess on the outside. Three across the course. Satoshi just behind them in fourth, awaiting some racing room. I'll have another kiss is next. Now taking the fourth spot as the top five are separated by just three lengths. Don't you forget looking for a way through as the field turns for home. Palio's Princess with a wide sweep to the lead clears off to open up to I'll have another kiss moves into second at the eighth pole. Don't you forget is starting to finish nicely. And here's don't you forget on the outside as Satoshi comes through at the rail. Don't you forget with good momentum blowing right by them all. Don't you forget, wrapped up, wins by about two. Palio's Princess, it's a photo between Satoshi and I'll have another kiss. And then it was Dulce Emma. We're all in line. And they're off. Quick start for Top Gun Tommy. Jamming Eddie came away in good order, too. And Patron Doro on the outside is flashing his natural early foot. They are joined now by Disco Ball, who emerges with the lead. So it's Disco Ball in front. Elector moves up a joint second inside Patron Doro. Top Gun Tommy is fourth at this point. And Lambo moves up inside of him, takes the joint second spot. Jamming Eddie is on hold behind this group of horses. The two trailers established an impossible task. And Disco Ball shakes loose into the far turn. It's Disco Ball opening up a three-length advantage. Top Gun Tommy moves into second. Patron Doro is now in third.
They are followed by Lambeau and Jamming Eddie right together, fourth and fifth, but six lengths off the lead. Established his next elector and impossible task. They turn for home. It's Disco Ball, Top Gun Tommy in pursuit second. Disco Ball, two length lead. Top Gun Tommy, Patron Doro, and Jamming Eddie, one furlong left. Disco Ball, Top Gun Tommy grinding away at him. Top Gun Tommy within a half length of Disco Ball. Top Gun Tommy, Disco Ball, Disco Ball. Top Gun Tommy, Top Gun Tommy runs down Disco Ball. Patron Doro was third, then established in Jamming Eddie. Draws in. The Golden Hour double is offered with 26 minutes to post. A little bit of movement. And they're off. Beautiful start. Verrat in the center. Kid Azteca hustled up for early speed. These two hook up at once. They're joined by Tigaran. Lemon Sushi in the orange colors is in the firing line, too. And Lemon Sushi is now up to be a part of the leader. Brigade with Tigaran. These two stride for stride. A neck back habeas pressing them third. Verrat settles nicely in fourth, about three lengths off the battle up top. They are followed by Polyak inside, tangled up in gray. Kid Azteca, who broke on top, is six lengths off the lead and a little more than two in front of Kimmer. Around the far turn, it's Lemon Sushi between horses, Tigaran at the rail. Habeas Pink Colors in third. Virat coming back for more. Polyak is the chestnut trying to thread through traffic as Kid Azteca will come about five wide, but is in the clear as they turn for home. Virat takes over. On the outside, Kid Azteca is starting to close some ground. Lemon Sushi is fighting on, but Virat has kicked well clear and waved goodbye. It is Virat capping off a nice day. Three for Frankie Dettori as Virat scrolls in. Kid Azteca, followed by Lemon Sushi, Polyak, and fifth went to Kimmer to complete the super high five.
It is a spectacular morning and afternoon here at the Great Race Place. Not a cloud in the sky, sun shines out, fast and firm conditions, a good nine race card. Hi everybody, my name is Tom Quigley, VIP Player Concierge, your seminar host for the next 35 minutes or so, sitting alongside the veteran jockey agent who represents both Antonio Fresu and Drain Van Dyke, his name, Tom Knutes. Tom, happy Saturday, welcome yeah, to the seminar. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Tom, I appreciate it, it. It's great to have you. Now, Antonio got off to a quick start. He has six wins already at the meet and four of them are stakes wins. You're certainly doing your job. Job. Yeah, for the first week. But we'll see what happens the second week. But no, he's a really good rider and it makes my job pretty easy as far as people want him and owners like him. And the good thing is the fans like him and that carries a lot of weight. So when the fans start saying they like your jock, then you're in good shape. How did you Antonio hook up? Of course, he, he rode primarily overseas. We don't really know much about him here in the United States other than riding in San Diego. Where did the connection take place? Well, the last seven years, he's riding Dubai during the winter, and then he'd ride in, um, in Italy and places in Europe during the um, summer months. But, um, and Leandro, who works for Doug O'Neill, they, they took horses over there about two or three years in a row. To Dubai. And he saw this rider and he contacted me and said, this guy can ride. And then when I had the opportunity, I only had one rider, um, I got a hold of him. But and, um, Leandro is the big big part of it. You give him a cut of the commission? I should, yes. <laughs> I should give him more than what I've been giving him, yeah. Now, you guys should wear a mask because you got away with a highway robbery in the Robert J. Frankel Stakes aboard a horse for Patty Gallagher called Angel Natashiko. The fractions were ridiculously slow, 25, 51, 115. Mm -hmm. It was just incredible the way that you guys were left uncontested on the lead, and naturally, you had something left. That was one of your four stakes wins up to this point. Yeah, I think a lot of times the other riders look at a horse that's a long shot. 18 to one so by the they, way they just kind of ignore them so they figure they're going to come back to them sure so which is natural and most of the time they do come back at that price but he was able to get some slow fractions and nobody pressed him and um it that's a combination a good combination for us so. what's what's antonio's attitude like both about southern california and sticking around of course it seems like he's here for the long term but does he like it is he friends with some of the other jocks is he a private guy do you guys hang out a lot like give us a glimpse into it what he's like personally tom no he hates it yeah. here no. <laughs> Like the rest of us. Yeah. No, he loves the weather. That's for sure. Um, he likes Southern California. He loved Del Mar. Going Who down doesn't? There. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but yeah, his wife is going to be coming over, but she works over in, um, overseas and she does like a TVG, um, uh -huh. and commentary or uh, XTV. And she goes ahead and when she gets a job, she can get a work permit. Then she's going to come over, but she doesn't want to be here and not work. Of course, so she's waiting till she gets that. And then when she comes over, she'll try to get a job. Now, I also mentioned at the opening time you represent Drayden Van Dyke, and of course, Drayden's taken a little bit of a break, and it's understandably so because Kyle Frey sort of did the same thing during the Delmar meet during the summer. He kind of took a step back from the game and said, "You know what? I need to get fresh, kind of mentally, and kind of be, be put in the right position." And Drayden's take, taken the same sort of approach, but he's planning to come back pretty soon and start working horses. I understand. Yeah, we're going to probably start working horses tomorrow, and it might be a while before he gets some mounts or any live mounts. But Drayden, he's had some problems and personal problems and he worked through it and he looks really good when i saw him he said all the right things and um so i think we can give it another try i mean our sport is unique tom right in terms of being a professional athlete most sports you can take a break whether it's basketball football hockey what have you in horse racing the jockeys and you you guys don't get a break you go 365 days a year it goes from circuit to circuit inevitably not only drayden but you and other jockeys and other agents you got to get burnt out it's just a natural natural, uh, you know, function of being a human being. Yeah. And I can see with riders I and mean, there's a lot of stress and different things. And then when you have personal problems with family and stuff, it makes it even, you know, tougher. So I, you know, I'm glad that he took the time off. I, I like his attitude right now and, um, he can ride. He's very talented. He's very strong. Um, and, um, I, I, I think he'll, I think he'll do okay. I'm going to leave a few jockeys names off, not intentionally, but just because the roster is so deep right now in our colony, but what a roster we have for the winter meet here at Southern California. Not only do we have Juan Hernandez and Umberto Rispoli, we've got Flavian Pratt in town. We've got Frankie Dettori who won three races yesterday. We've got, uh, you know, just Joel Rosario started riding here yesterday on a full-time basis. This is the deepest I can remember the colony being in quite some time, Tom. And that's right after I convinced Antonio to stay here. I was saying it's going to be easy. <laughs> but actually, he doesn't mind it. He likes the competition. He thinks when you ride against better riders, you ride better. 
Um, he's really good friends with Zatori and um, and with Spoli. So yeah, I don't think he minds at all. He, he sure hasn't shown it yet. Tom's a Vietnam vet. He knows that freedom isn't free, but his selections today are going to be free. If you watch the seminar, we're going to find out who Tom likes on today's nine race card. But before we do any of that, let's toss the microphone over to track announcer Frank Miramati and get the changes on today's Saturday's card here at the Great Race Place. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast. The turf is firm with the rail on the turf at zero feet. Here are the changes. In the first race, start of the early pick five. Number two, bougie-like, make the jockey Antonio Fraysu. Edwin Maldonado will not be riding today. In the second, there's no show wagering with the scratch of number five, Lonesome Stew. There's no show wagering and there will be a revised morning line. In the third event, no changes. Turning to race four, number three, Wailea Sunset. The jockey is Antonio Fraysu. The pick six starts with the fourth race. In the fifth, we have program scratches of one and 12. Note that number 11, EJ won the cup, will now be ridden by Mike Smith. The fifth race, in addition to being the start of the late pick five, kicks off the $3 all-turf pick three. Turning to the six, start of the late pick four, scratch number five, Ginobili. Race seven, scratch five, irresistible force. And note that number seven, tickle my fancy, will be ridden by Tiago Pereira. The eighth is the grade two, San Vicente Stakes. Start of the golden hour pick four, there are no changes. And in the ninth, scratch number six, percolate. Race nine, take out the six. Enjoy your day at Santa Anita Park, the great race place. Post time for the opener is in 58 minutes at 12 noon. We do have the coast to coast pick five. It starts today. It's a great sequence kicking off at Gulfstream Park with their ninth race, which goes off in a little more than two hours, 106 Pacific time. Gulfstream's ninth and 10th. San Anita's fifth, Gulfstream's 11th, and San Anita's seventh. It's the Coast to Coast Pick 5 every Saturday and Sunday. Player friendly, 15% takeout, and a $1 minimum wager. Let's go back to Quigley's Corner in the studio. Tom's special guest today is Tom Knust. Welcome back. We're talking horses with Tom Knutz. He's the agent for both Antonio Fresu and Drayden Van Dyke. It's our pleasure to have him today. He's had a busy morning so far this morning. Did uh, your jocks work any horses this morning, specifically Antonio? Yeah, he worked um, two horses for Doug and one horse for Mark Glatt. How'd they do? Anybody we can look forward to in the future? Anybody take your breath away? No, they all work well, but usually I don't even ask who they are because I'm a big believer in your ride for stables and um and then we pick up the good horses when you know and if he comes back and says something special then i'll go talk to the trainer but unless he doesn't say anything which is work horses the old joke tom is to be a good agent all you need is a pencil and condition book but i know it goes deeper than that and you just mentioned it you know you need to have relationships and you've been around for a long time your relationships with both doug o'neill and mark Latt, two guys you just mentioned is really uh, kind of stood the test of time what other things do you need to bring to the table like uh, as an example, how much time do you spend handicapping? In other words, you got to know where to place your jock, who's on the live mounts. You have to look ahead as opposed to us that look at the past performances the day of. Like, how much time do you actually spend handicapping? Well, a lot of it is that you go through the horses you've been riding. 
and the ones you want to write back and you mark those down and those are the ones that you really concentrate on and then you just when you talk and go over the book with you know like right now we write a lot for phil the motto and peter urton mm -hmm. and carla Gaines and doug o'neill and mark Glatt. those are like our five main stables we sure. write for so then you you make sure you go over the horses you've been riding and you want to write them back and then you talk to them about other horses that possibly you can ride that you know they're going to need a rider on i should didn't know this, but I took the Del Mar meet off, so unfortunately, I do not. Has Antonio been able to break into the Bob Baffert barn yet? Have you guys ridden any horses it's for funny him? You should say that because Bob likes Antonio when he Bob, likes you too, doesn't he? Oh, well, maybe so. So, <laughs> but when he goes to Dubai, um, Antonio works his horses for him, uh huh. And he's said on numerous times he's got to try to get Antonio on sure. a horse, but um, hasn't happened yet. But um, Eventually, hopefully it will. You need patience to be a good jockey agent as well, yeah, don't you? Yeah, and, and, you know, when he wants us, he'll ask us. Sure. Well, I'm going to ask you who you like on today's nine race car. Kicking things off, Tom, in race number one. We are on the turf course in race number one. The rails today are at zero feet, and race number one not only starts the 50-cent early pick five, but it's a maiden special weight a maiden special weight race for Calbred. Phillies and mirrors going one mile on the turf course. There's a field of nine, as you heard track announcer Frank Miramati say, put Tom's jockey Antonio Fresu on number two, bougie like uh, Edwin Mal Donato will not ride this afternoon. Morning line of eight to one on Bougie, like and kind of vying for favoritism right now at three to one. Your buddy Doug O'Neill gave you the pickup mount. What can you tell us about Bougie, like? Well, I only know they wanted to try the horse long on the turf. He ran the one time and, and really didn't show much. And it was what a maiden 50. So moving up in class, going on the grass for the first time, going long for the first time. So I think. He's, she def, definitely has an uphill climb, but um, they really want to try her long, and, and they think she can run long, so I think she's got a shot. Now, you also mentioned the Carla Gaines Barn, who you write a lot for. Number eight in her prime is the actual uh, current betting choice at five to two off a morning line of eight to one. Did Carla whisper anything in your ear about in her prime? No, but a lot of people are probably looking because Joe Rosario's on, on her, and he's one of the best riders in the country. So I think a lot of people look at it, you know, when they see a rider like him on a horse like that. You mentioned Joel Rosario being one of the best riders in the country. Your rider, Antonio Frace, who's quickly climbing into that category. What would you consider some of his strengths? What do you think he does best or what are maybe some of the things you think he excels at? I think he gets horses in the right position. Um, he, he really studies the races, when he rides a horse, he'll watch his last races, he'll watch the other horse races. So I think he puts them in the right position and he's very strong. So whether he's getting the horse out of the gate and getting good position or finishing, he's a very strong finisher. And it sounds like he's dedicated to his craft as well. I mean, all the things that go on behind the scenes that we don't see, yeah. that's really all about preparation and probably leads to his success. Yeah, we shared a place this uh, fall at Del Mar and every time I'd come home, the place he could plug his um, computer in was the kitchen and he's always standing there looking at races when I came back uh -huh. I don't know how many hours I'd go to bed and go to sleep but he really puts he's he, he's really proud about his craft and really works hard on it Fair enough. Bougie like ridden by Antonio Fresu, Tom's top selection in race number one. Let's turn the page, Tom. Take a look at race number two. Begins the 50 cent early pick four. This time we're sprinting on the main track. Six furlongs the distance. It's a starter optional claiming race. Big scratch in the race. The original morning line favorite from the Mark Glatbar, number five, Lonesome Stew, has been declared out of the race. Favoritism likely to fall now on number three, California Tiger. But she also ran another one in here for Doug O'Neill, number four, Toledo Tiger. Big price on the morning line. First off the claim, taken from your buddy Mark Glatt to another buddy, Doug O'Neill, what can you tell us about Toledo Rocket? Well, I actually have never been on the horse and didn't ride it last time, but um, they were going to look at the cowbred race coming up next week, and, and there still might be a possibility. But this was a light race. She's eligible for it, so Doug thought they'd take a shot here. I think 15-1 to 1 is a little high on this horse. I think he's only hit, ran one time, and the horse can improve off that race. Sure. So I definitely would throw that horse in the mix, and I think definitely it's a 3-4 um, exacto. California Tiger, the one to beat. Jeff Mullins yes. is the trainer. Jeff Mullins obviously uses Hector Barrios a lot. You had any success by breaking into the Jeff Mullins barn? Not really, because Jeff's one that you have to work a lot of horses for, mm -hmm. and I just don't have a lot of opportunities to work horses for sure. other trainers. So the races, the ones I pick up are more like, you know, the the, the horses that maybe some rider gets in problem with and, and they, they need a rider. But Jeff's a great trainer, and I've ridden before him. We won the Santa Anita Derby with 
um, Jose Valdivia a few years back. But that horse definitely is the one to beat. It has speed, and um, that definitely would be my top choice. We've talked a lot about trainers and jockeys and horses, but we haven't talked about the owners yet. And Doug O'Neill obviously has a lot of loyal owners. I look at the ownership group for Toledo Rocket. Uh, Ty Leatherman certainly uh, not only owns Toledo Rocket, part owner, but also owns Bougie Like in the first race. Todd Cady needs no introduction to the winner's circle. He won the uh, grade one cotillion earlier with Doug O'Neill as the trainer. The, the, these guys, I know them. They're actually a lot of fun to hang out with, right, Tom? They're great people to hang out with. Um, they, um, you just, um, they're just, they love the game. They put their money into it, and they're just really good people. And you know, if you lose, you lose, and and they don't get down on you too much. So, but definitely, they they love the game, and definitely they have a good time. Wish we had a million more like them. That's oh, yeah. for sure. I Ray, love that <laughs> race number three. We're sprinting on the turf course, six furlongs on the flat turf course for fillies and mares. Allowance optional claiming types. Nine winners of two. Other than we've got a field of five. Morning line favorite number two, Kitty Katana from the Phil D'Amato Barn at six to five on John White's morning line. But you're not far behind with the Peter Erton training number four. She's got away. Talk to us about race three, Tom. Well, as you know, Peter Erton's hot. Yes, really he is. That's, that, that's, that's an understatement. Six months, he's just been killing it. And um, I really think this sets up good for she got away. I, I think that, she, you know, there's enough speed to give her be able to be in a good position. And she has a good cr closing kick. And um, I definitely think she'll be right there at, at the wire. You know, Tom, it's interesting. I'm looking at the past performances for She's Got Away. And a lot of runners uh, that I've seen so far this meet kind of fit this category. Literally, She's Got Away only has one start since late August, and that was in November. These horses are so lightly raced, they really could improve dramatically just off that one simple prep race. Well, and a, a lot of it is that there just hasn't been the opportunity to run. Sure. Between um, Los Alamitos Los and Alameda, some of the rain. Yeah, yeah, in the rain, some of the races are not going. So he really hasn't had a, a lot of opportunities run, but I do agree with you. And she's the one that just seems to be getting better and better. And um, I, I think she'll be very tough here. And Kitty Katana, the post-time favorite, certainly looks dangerous as well. Juan Hernandez, what is it about him that we always find him on top of the jockey standings? Of course, he's got a great agent himself and Craig O'Brien, but what, what does Juan bring to the table that maybe you admire? Well, again, Juan is is a great rider, and I've watched him ride for you know up north and down here, and he is somebody that just is a very professional, and he puts the horses he puts horses in a good spot, and he because he's been doing well and he's got a good agent like Craig, he's getting on some of the better horses, which and, and then riding for Baffert doesn't hurt, <laughs> and it gives you some confidence and stuff. But Juan's a great rider, and he he's he's going to be here a long time. He sure is. Race number four begins the $1 pick six sequence. That's right. Traditional $1 pick six. No more jackpot, uh, single ticket carryovers and things of that sort. And we kick things off in race number four for the $1 pick six, burning six furlongs in the main track for Maine special weight Calbred, three-year-old fillies. If you have the program in front of you, the entire field of seven are all first-time Lasix users. The morning line favorite from the Gary Studi Barn is number four, Safa. You're the replacement rider at number three, YLA Sunset for trainer Ian Krujak. What can you tell us about YLA Sunset, Tom? I really don't know much because I haven't been on the horse and I just knew Edwin was um, looked like he wasn't going to ride, so I'd call Ian and we ride a lot for Ian. Um, and so hopefully the horse will run well. I've got to say the four, Gary Studi. Now, last time I was on the show, maybe a few years ago, Steve Miotti and Gary was sitting there and I talked about different trainers. They were and watching you. And they I... Were... And I completely skipped over Gary Studi, which now they give me a hard time. It's live TV. Yeah. Don't they understand that? You know, it's so, impossible to so, remember everything. Gary Studi, I honestly think, is one of the best trainers back there. I think he's very underrated. He doesn't have a lot of horses. But, you know, having your, your dad, you know, Mel Studi and your uncle Warren Studi, you have to have some really good. And he's been running a lot of seconds and thirds. This horse has run seconds and third. Today, I think, is the day for this horse. Now, we don't want to leave anybody out, Tom. You mentioned Gary Studi being the trainer of Sapa, but take a look at the breeder none other than Derek Lawson what's a jockey agent doing breeding racehorses now who's Derek Lawson <laughs> now Derek ever since he had Pratt he started buying horses and dibbling dabbling in it and I think he's done pretty well so yeah but that's why um Tiago's on the horse Tiago and um Hopefully they'll get the job done. But if they don't, I'd rather see the three win. Sure. And Peter Miller uh, trains number one, Fiamina. Uh, I have to both uh, 
Phineas and Fifi Farrow for the Terry Lovinger operation. First time LASIX hasn't been seen since July. Layoff runner for the Peter Miller barn. Always very, very dangerous. Race number five, Tom, begins the 50 cent late pick five. It also begins the $3 all turf pick three. That's a relatively new wager here at Sandy. A minimum is $3 and it comprised uh, the final three turf races on every single day's card. And we kick things off here on the turf course in race number five. Sprinting six furlongs on the flat turf course for maiden special weight three-year-olds. There's two program scratches. Scratch the one and the 12, both inside and in, inside and outside will not compete. Uh, take note number four is a first-time gelding. The jockey and number 11, EJ won the cup is Mike Smith. You ride a horse in here by the name of Sketchy. And ironically, Sketchy exits the same race as EJ won the cup, as well as Money Makes Money, as well as uh, EJ won the cup, who I mentioned. They all ran in the first race on Thanksgiving Day at Delmar. That was back on November 23rd. We're going to watch the replay. Listen to Larry Colmas describe the action. The runner I want you to pay attention to breaks from post position number four. That would be Money Makes Money money in today's race you'll see that uh he completely misses the break he's in the uh, red uh, the red silks and the white cap he'll be easy to follow sure looks like he was best in this race let's listen to larry colmas describe the action back in november they're off money makes money was slow to start good beginning for practically broke who goes out to the early lead from ej won the cup and sharp lorenzo away second and third and then it's sketchy ned to the outside Followed at the rail by eight clap and a break of free to money makes money. Daddy Justify is last early on. So they're racing for the far turn and it's practically broke the leader. EJ won the cup three quarters of a length behind running along second by four. Then sketchy surrounded by sharp Lorenzo and Ned to the outside. Eight clap has six lengths to make up. Then money makes money and nothing from Daddy Justify who's well out of the race as they come to the top of the stretch. Practically broke, and EJ won the cup. Arrive at the eighth pole, right together. Three lengths ahead of Sketchy. Then it's eight clap on the outside. Practically broke, has it close to home from EJ won the cup. Late run, money makes money at the wire. Practically broke, does it. Does it. Money makes money, Tom. Missed the break and sure put in a furious rally there late for a first time starter. That distance was at five furlongs. And as you can see in the gallop out, certainly looks like six furlongs is going to be a friend of money makes money. But money makes money does break from the rail with the scratch of number one, McVeigh. You also ride a horse that we just watched the replay for number eight, Sketchy, who was in that race for trainer Ron Ellis. Give us your thoughts on race five. Well, Ron had just called me and needed a rider. And he just said he thought this horse had gotten in trouble and could run better than it did the last two times. And if the horse improves a couple of links from the last two times, then I think it has a shot, especially at 20 to one. Um, I think probably Island Cruiser is the one to beat. Um, I think that horse ran huge its first time out. And again, you got Sadler and Joe Rosario, which is a big combination. I know John likes Joel and Joel runs, rides well for him. Um, so I, I would say that you're probably looking at the two and the 10. And then I was a long shot, the eight. We uh, we talked about some agents, including yourself and Craig O'Brien, but we haven't talked about uh, the self-proclaimed super agent, Ron Anderson, who has both Joel Rosario and Frankie DeTore. He's loaded for this bear. Uh, he's loaded uh, with bear for this meet as well, Tom. Yeah, again, I, I think Ron does an excellent job and he's, he's done really well throughout the years and stuff. But when you have the rider, it makes a lot of difference. And you can't get any better than DeTore or Joel. So it's getting them that's the hard part, right? Because John DeSantis, who was a longtime agent, said to me one time, the secret to being a good agent is to have a good rider. It sounds simple, but yeah. if you don't have the person who can produce on the racetrack, it's going to be a long, uh, long, cold winter for you. Yeah, I remember in 2006, I had Pat Valenzuela and we won the title here. And I'd have two or three horses to choose from every race. So it wasn't very tough. Sure, sure. And uh, Patrick, we've seen around the racetrack a little bit, and I think yeah. he's galloping some horses. At San Luis Rey, I he, think he's working. Yeah, I mean, he's might a little be bit. working for Peter Miller right now. I think you're right. I think you're right. So yeah. it's good to see him. He's obviously had a world of ability his entire career. Oh, yeah. Just had to, you know, struggle with some personal problems. But what a talent he was, and I'm sure, I'm sure it was a, a pleasure to work with. Yeah, I'd say with top three riders, maybe four riders in the, that has ever ridden, I think he'd be one of them. And that's big company, considering we're talking about Bill Shoemaker and Lafitte Pinkai yeah. and many other jockeys, that, Eddie Delahousse, yeah. sure, oh, sure. Yeah. Race number six begins a 50 cent late pick four back sprinting on the main track, six and a half furlongs is the distance. It's an allowance optional claiming race, nine winners of two other than. We've got a field of five after the scratch of number five, Ginobili. Morning line favorite number four, Big City Lights, who sure happy to not see the chosen Vron in this race. He's finished uh, second to the big, uh, 
uh, to the uh, chosen run at least four consecutive times. Richard Mandela adds Lasix with Flavia and Pratt in the saddle. You don't ride this race, Tom, so who do you like and why? Well, I think that might be the horse to beat. Rick Big City Lights. I think probably Juan, he's been riding the horse, but maybe he's committed to Bob on, and, and on more tequila. Um, the one's got good works, but so does the four. So I think narrowing it down and stuff, definitely I think the four is the one to beat. It's a good race. And let's talk a little bit more about Mark Glad, who trains the outside horse number six escape route. It's kind of family affair, right? Because Mark more and more now as his son starts to age and mature is leaning more and more on his son as an assistant. The whole Glad family is like kind of a cool production because even their dad was a longtime trainer up in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, his dad, Ron Glad, was one of the leading riders up there in Washington. And, and people that I talked to that were up there said he was a very good horseman. And he won a lot of races. So if you had a jockey, that's probably one of the first barns you'd go to. Sure, sure. And Mark certainly is following in that family tradition as well. He certainly knows how to get to the winner's circle. Race number seven, it's good to see we're coming down the hillside turf course. Six and a half furlongs down the hill for fillies and mares. It's an allowance race, non-winners of one other than. Scratch the five, irresistible force, leaves us with a field of eight. Take note, the jockey at number seven, Tickle My Fancy, is now Tiago Pereira. You ride number four, Miss Lizzie for the Doug O'Neill barn. Big five to one on the morning line. Before we get your thoughts on the race, Tom, let's show the workout courtesy of X courtesy of our friends at XP TV. It's uh, back on March 24th, the day before Christmas, working uh, in company with a uh, maiden winner from the Doug O'Neill barn. Miss Lizzie is down there on the inside. The thing I want to take note of right away is take a look at the size of the exercise rider. looks like this guy just jumped in from Jack in the Box. We know that's not Antonio. This is a big sized, heavier type of exercise rider. And this horse worked really, really well, in my opinion. Yeah, well, this Doug got in a jam, so Doug worked this horse himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. I don't know who the exercise rider is on. I don't recognize. But, but they, you can even see the bigger. comparison to the other exercise rider, much bigger exercise rider, which is what I like because the time is legit and the horse is doing it easy. Yeah. And and, and on the workouts and stuff, it last two works on Miss Lizzie, they have B plus works. And you did ride Miss Lizzie back at San Anita, sprinting six furlongs on the flat turf course, two back. Last time out, Hector Barrios actually rode her to victory going two turns. Now, now Doug decides to cut back coming down the hill. A lot of times we've seen, Tom, you know this, horses that like routing sure seem to like coming down the hill. Yeah, I think milers love the six and a half down. That's a good thing about the hills. You can take sprinters, three-quarter horses, and they can get that extra half furlongs. And milers can get the six and a half. It's just a perfect race for Santa Anita and especially for those horses but speaking of Miss Lizzie that's my best bet of the day okay Miss Lizzie at five to one I have a feeling it would be for a variety of reasons even though it's your best bet I'm sure you respect number two cast member adding Lasix for the first time a Calbred who has won three of her four lifetime starts including multiple stakes races she's never been down the hill and Timmy Octine actually has a, had a very productive meet so far a lot of seconds with no wins but 50 percent finishing second is not a bad ratio yeah, Tim does a really, really good job. And actually, I had an opportunity to ride this horse. I think it might have been when it first came back. It might have been Delmar. I forget. But the horse had a scratch. I couldn't ride it. I was on something else. And I was really upset. I tried to get off the horse I was on. So I really wanted to ride this horse. Um, but I think it was, might have been. I've been on one for Vladimir Seren. But, um, yeah, definitely this horse is live. you got a great owner in George Kikorian. And Tim's been doing a great job, and he can't do much better than Pratt. So, But I still say he'll run second. Miss Lizzie, Tom, Tom uh, Canoose is best bet on today's card. Tom, a question for you. Bring up a good point. There's so many things that go on behind the scenes that you can't control, and inevitably sometimes it impacts you financially, as you just described with cast member. How do you maintain your sanity through all this craziness? I think you got to do is just take a day at a time. Just take a day at a time and not worry about it because sometimes you're going to get taken off a good horse and it's going to win. Sometimes you're going to pick up a good horse and it's going to win. So it all balances out. You just can't let it get to you. I mean, actually, this is my 54th year on the racetrack and my 22nd year as an agent. And the last thing I thought I'd do is be an agent. <laughs> so, but um, you just have to take it day by day and figure it Sometimes it's going to work out and sometimes it doesn't. And you love what you do and it certainly shows. Yeah, it yeah, it, it makes it easy to come to work, that's for sure. Race number eight begins the $1 Golden Hour Pick 4, linking our last two races here with the last two races of Golden Gain. And we kick things off in race number eight with the stakes race on today on today's card. The grade two San Vicente sprinting seven furlongs for three-year-olds. The aforementioned Bob Baffert trains the first two morning line choices in here, including Muth, who finished second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, four to five on the morning line. Going from a route to a sprint, I'm sure there's perhaps uh, bigger fish to fry down the line from youth but is he the one to beat 
Well, I mean, he was he was one of the favorites, or if not the favorite in the in Breeders' Cup. So, I mean, I think he's a really, really good horse and lo really talented. Juan's been riding him. He knows the horse. Um, I think didn't Juan ride on by Pilot Commander? He did. Yeah. So he chose a mute yeah. instead. Yeah, I think Bob pretty much lets Craig choose if he has two horses in a race. But then Pilot Commander's been working really well. So, but still has moved. So I, I think it's got to be one of those two horses and. Um, when you come to three-year-olds and two-year-olds, when we go back to the two-year-old programs, Baffert's pretty dominant. Yes, he is. And Tom, a question for you. I see that Muth is uh, the sire is good magic, pilot commander, the sire is justified. You wear a lot of hats, and you talked about how you've been in this game for over 50 years, 22 years as an agent. Do you spend much time looking at breeding when it comes to selecting a mount for your, uh, for your jockey? You just kind of let the trainer and the owners decide that for yeah. you. Yeah. The worst thing in the world is that a trainer comes to you and says their owner paid $2 million for a horse. You do not want to ride the horse. <laughs> No, so no, I don't really pay attention to the breeding or what they cost or anything. It's just more or less like, like I said, I work with individuals and there's people that you want to ride for that maybe you don't get to work horses for. And when they ask you, I don't even ask them the name of the horse. I just take it. So. Race number nine closes out the day. And in race number nine, we're offering $5 golden hour daily double wagering. Similar concept. Last race here with the last race at Golden Gate. We're going on the turf course. A mile and an eighth is a distance. Allowance optional claiming types. Non-winners of one other than one scratch. Scratch the six percolate. Leaves us with a field of 11. Number 12 is a first time gelding. You ride the morning line favor for trainer Peter Miller. Number two, legislator Antonio Fresu is in the saddle. Seven to two, indicating a loop warm favoritism question for you first time peter kind of likes peter usually my understanding is likes his uh, jacks to come down to san louis ray and maybe give some of his horses test spins do you guys ever go down to san louis ray we actually in the past went down quite a bit um now it's, it makes it a little tougher only because we're working so many horses up here but i'd say we've been down there at least a dozen times and worked horses for him. And I really, I've always got along with Peter. I think he's a great trainer. And, um, you know, a lot of times he'll go ahead, like this, this instance, he needed a rider that morning. And I was lucky enough to pick up the mount. But actually, I was supposed to try to ride this horse a couple of times. And Peter wanted me on it at Del Mar. But I had mounts and I couldn't get off of them. So it's nice to get back on this horse, to get on this horse this time. And I think it would be really, really tough. I mean, the only problem, I think, is if there's enough speed in this race. I think the the... Jonathan Thomas one is going to be very tough. Particularly from that yeah, post. Yeah. And then the five, um, I think, is tough. Neil Drysdale. But again, because of the pace, we hopefully whoever doesn't get into much trouble might win it. So hopefully I'll have a good trip. One other question for you, Tom, before we wrap up the seminar, and that is you've talked about uh, watching uh, Tony watch replays until the middle of the night. When do you guys actually kind of recap the day's action? In other words, some agents go down and talk to the jockey immediately after the race. Some agents I never see talk to the jocks at all during the racing day. Like just to recap, who'd you like, who didn't you like in terms of Tony's opinion? When do you guys do that? Yeah, usually I'll see him after the last race. And if there's a specific horse he doesn't like, he'll say something. But um, that's pretty much, you know, he knows, I mean, you can watch the race. You can see if he got in trouble or not. You can see if he's a good horse. You see, you can see pretty much if you want to ride the horse back. So it really doesn't, there's not really too much dialogue there. Um, he, he will go ahead and give his opinion about certain things. And he might say the horse could use blinkers. This horse wants to go two turns or something. You know, so he'll come up with opinions like that. So. Tom, it's a pleasure having you on the seminar. I know you're a busy man, both morning, day, and night. So thanks so much for uh, giving us your insight. Continued success, both with Antonio and with Drayden on the come, I'll come Back Trail. I'm sure we'll try and do it again sometime later in the meet. Right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. Keep in mind, live racing resumes tomorrow, Sunday as well. Nine race card beginning at noon Pacific. That means the seminar starts at 10.50 a.m. Make sure you join us. Until then, good luck, everybody. Have fun, and we'll see you tomorrow.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem. <laughs> 